The whole goal of neurofeedback is to help the brain as a whole better regulate. And when that brain is better regulated, people can process things at a different level than when it's not. Welcome to Talking About Kids. I am your host, R. Bradley Snyder, researcher, activist, and co-author of the What Every Child Needs to Know series of board books for pre-readers. When Bessel van der Kolk says that neurofeedback has the potential to help kids reshape their brains to be more regulated, more open to new experiences, well, one takes notice. After all, helping kids stay regulated is the first thing that we, as people who care about kids, need to do to help ensure their success. So I was excited to talk with Diane Costo, the CEO and founder of Symmetry Neuropathway Training. Diane is a self-described mom on a mission to bring neurofeedback services to everyone. The story of this passion and what neurofeedback did for her kid and can potentially do for the kids in your life is next. This podcast was sponsored in part by the Arizona Department of Health Services Must Stop Bullying campaign through its Title V Maternal and Child Health Program. For more information, go to muststopbullying.org. And now, the interview. My youngest son was very impulsive off the charts and got kicked out of many different school environments that I tried for him. Mm. Uh, literally, we tried um, private school, home school, boarding school, home school again, military academy <laughs> from when he was about five years old till um, going on 12 at that point. I'd get a phone call, you know, we really love him, but he's not following the program. You need to come and get him, mm -hmm. that kind of impulsivity. And um, by the time he was 12, I decided to put him in a military academy program, uh, thinking that it would be a great environment for him. He mm -hmm. would love it. But at that point, there was so much like violence in the house. He was refusing to do the homeschool work. I couldn't find a local school that worked for him. Um, and I said, you've got to make this work for you, buddy, or you're not welcome back. That's how extreme it was. Mm. And he got to the military academy and was doing fine at first and got himself into trouble. And they called me, come and get him. Yeah. And I had to say no. And I, it was one of the hardest things I ever did because I, all of those years, I tried to avoid him becoming one of those quote unquote troubled teens that mm -hmm. have to go off to those therapeutic programs. But here we were, and that's what happened. I had him transported to a therapeutic program. And then I was like, well, at least now they're gonna know how to handle him because I haven't been able to figure it out all of this time, right? And that's what they designed those types of schools for. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what happened a few yeah. months in? Yeah. Get the call from the CEO. He's a genius, we love him, but he's not following the program. What are we gonna do? And at that point, of course, I was ready to lose my mind, um, but I was also introduced, fortunately, to the founder of a neurofeedback company who lived in the small community that I did in South Carolina. And I, I started to learn about that, and I was wondering, you know, something's got to be up. This is a little more extreme than just the average kid with ADHD, right? Right. And so I'm introduced to this doctor who was trying to make it easier for chiropractors to incorporate neurofeedback into their practices and he said that's the kind of kid we can help and so i was like hey i'm, I'm out of options this makes sense there's got to be something going on with the communication in his brain and let's do it and so <laughs> i went through the training at that point a three-day in intensive training and then i drove from south carolina to the middle of nowhere Kanab, utah it was actually where my son was in that program and set up neurofeedback in that school. That's how I became interested in neurofeedback. Wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, um, way too many of the experts that have appeared on the Talking About Kids podcast started out looking for solutions for their own kids when everything else was failing. So I think that's a, unfortunately, an all too common 
experience for people. Well, I do want to take a step back right. and kind of define what we mean when we say neurofeedback training. What is it? Yeah, so neurofeedback is basically technology-driven learning for the brain. Hmm. It's a form of biofeedback. More Sometimes people have heard the term biofeedback. But basically, you're measuring something in the body with biofeedback. And in the brain, they call it neuro because you're measuring the brainwave activity. Hmm. And then the technology gives that individual <clears throat> some information on what's going on in their system. So there might be heart rate variability training for biofeedback, or it may be skin temperature response training, and in the brain, it's brainwave training. So uh, the person in the sessions would be just kicked back, there's a couple sensors on their scalp, the software's analyzing their brainwave activity when it meets a healthy, well-regulated pattern, whatever they're watching, they can stream Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, anything like that. The software will put an overlay over top of it and it'll play a little bit brighter and louder so they can hear it and see it better when their brain's meeting the pattern that we want to encourage. And then it goes dimmer or quieter when the brain's not producing a healthy mm. pattern. So that's the feedback part. It's rewarding the brain um, to produce that healthier pattern. And the brain, it's a natural process because we want to hear things better and see things better when we're interested in it. So the brain will figure out what patterns it has to create in order to see it better. So now, that's it. Yeah. It, so I have, a, I have a bunch of questions. Um, Great. One question I have is when the subject is hooked up and they're getting that feedback on their brain waves, are you giving them any sort of prompts to how to control or things that they might do to gain control over those brain waves? Through the system that I use, we just want them to relax okay. and let their brain and the software communicate because it's too complicated to really feel or sense mm. what patterns they're you know producing in their brain. Way back when in the 60s, 70s, when neurofeedback just started and they would use maybe just one component band of brainwave right. activity, you might be able to kind of sense when you were in that zone producing more, like a hyper alert yeah. or a more relaxed state. But now, the complexity and what we've understood that the brain can actually handle, it could be as detailed as increase 8 to 11 hertz frequency and reduce you know, 15 to 20, uh, one site over here on the mm -hmm. left side, and then a, a whole other combination on a site over on the right side. And so a person can't feel that, but the brain can figure it out because they, the brain naturally will, knows what it wants to, you know, it will figure out what to do to see that um, visual better. Now, regular listeners of the Talking About Kids podcast will be very familiar with things like ACEs and trauma responses. And they're probably also familiar with things like EMDR. Now, EMDR will require that you actually kind of revisit that traumatized or that, that, that state in order to change your brain's responses to it. But it doesn't sound like you're asking the subjects to re-experience anything in this process. No, we're not, and that is a really nice feature of it, too. The whole goal of neurofeedback is to help the brain as a whole better regulate. Mm. And when that brain is better regulated, the communication is, is more clear, people can process things at a different level than when it's not. And my son, for instance, the patterns in his brain didn't allow him a pause before reacting. Mm -hmm. He just reacted to his environment no matter he, where he went. No, and no matter what we taught him and what he knew and how uh, remorseful he might have been, he just didn't have that physical ability to pause before reacting. Right. And it came down to those brainwave patterns. So once we were able to better regulate his brain, then he could stop and pause and make his own decisions, and it saved his life. So, yeah, that's the whole goal is to better regulate the brain so that then the other therapies and approaches or decisions or even processing trauma can happen at a, at a different level. So let's talk then about the kinds of kids that would benefit most from this. So obviously that, that ability to regulate is so critical. That's something that we've also talked an awful lot about on this podcast. Um, so is it... I, I know that you were open that your son had ADHD. That was a diagnosis. Is in more general terms, what sort of kids benefit most from this kind of therapy? 
Mm -hmm. And just a note, I didn't really have my son formally diagnosed mm. um, because he came across as just a 110% boy with a bad attitude and kept getting oh. labeled and kicked out. More of like an oppositional type thing. Okay. Um, he had been to a pediatric neurologist because I, he was so extreme at, at some points that I thought maybe there was Tourette's mm. involved. And she medicated him for a time period, but he was not formally diagnosed. Um, because the way he presented yeah. as the little tough guy, you know. I apologize. Um, I thought I had read no, that in your no. bio. I apologize. No. <laughs> That's okay. He would have typically been if uh, probably mm. if I went the standard medical route to, you know, they probably would have pegged him with that. But I just kept trying to find places that would work for him, and I wasn't a real big fan of the diagnoses and the and the letters and everything. Um, but that being said, that is one of the most popular things that people come to us for is focus and attention issues. And that was some of the early research that was done in the 60s and 70s with neurofeedback. But really, um, we have professional athletes using it mm -hmm. now, Olympic teams using it, uh, special forces, uh, business people to up their game. Um, but most common we're seeing now is anxiety mm -hmm. above all. Even the kiddos and the adults that come to us for focus and attention issues, we see often patterns of anxiety in their brain maps. Oh, so I think this is a, a, a really great segue because you know I kind of want to walk listeners through what they might expect if they're going to sign up for this because one of the things that we know is that even when we recognize that this is a, a treatment, a therapy, a program that we should engage. Um, we can, it can be so scary to try something new, to take a, that first step into the office or enter a new therapeutic environment. So if, if I decide that this is something that would, would work for me or for my kid, what should I expect? Mm -hmm. So um, in my uh, the way we provide it with symmetry neuropathway training mm -hmm. is very non-medical, very um, technology-driven learning, mm -hmm. uh, layman in a sense, because I'm a mom on a mission. I didn't, I was not in the medical field, so I'm not doing therapy. We're just using this tool to help better regulate the brain. So we really like to keep it a nice, relaxed environment. Most of my offices, I have actually personally closed. And I help other providers provide, and we are in therapeutic programs in schools and we have home training. So how that looks is we have the software that's made specifically very simplified to be used at home. We will um, have an initial conversation with you when you call in, set the expectations, make sure it's a good fit for you. We um, then prepare the equipment, send it out to you. We do an onboarding call to let you meet everybody on the team, who your coach is gonna be, our case managers who are managing it behind the scene and what for you to expect, you know, and we'll help you map your child <laughs> or yourself at home while we're zooming in with you. Mm -hmm. It's the beauty of technology now. Um, and we show you where to place the sensors and you open up the software and click, you know, four different steps, plug in the amplifier, test your connection, open up what you're gonna watch and hit start. And you have a very simplified version happening in front of you where you're just having that fading and the signal um, check is on there too if you need to just double check how much time you've been training mm -hmm. or what your signal looks like and that's it you do that you know daily or a couple times a day with the coach's assistance they'll they'll let you know how long and um, it's a very simple process for people and so when you say the placement of the sensors the what I think the the pictures I've seen it, it sort of looks like a swimming cap a am I correct yeah that's the, well that's the beginning part so we use that looks like the swimming cap mm -hmm. with the 19 different sensors in it to do the initial mapping of the brainwave activity. Okay. So in that instance, that's kind of the first step along with some assessments that you do online. We take recordings with that cap on with your eyes closed and then with your eyes open and then that data gets compared to a normative database mm -hmm. so that we can find out what areas of your brain are functioning well and which areas are off. And we have a really simplified report that will show that. And it gives people so much hope to finally have something measurable. You know, mm -hmm. if they've struggled with irritability or anger or, you know, attention or focus issues, impulsivity, and we can show them something now that's concrete. Mm. <laughs> and here, this is why you've been struggling with this. There is a physical reason that your mood regulation is, is off. And, and then, you know, 
the hope is there because we know that we can better regulate the brain through this process. And in terms of dosage, so how many times, uh, like how often uh, do you recommend doing this? Does it change over time? And you know, how quickly can people expect to see benefits? Mm -hmm. With the in office, we people we always recommended two to three times a week. But with the home training, we're finding that people can even do a session daily or and work up to twice a day. Mm. It's kind of like learning to play a musical instrument. The more you practice, the more your brain's going to learn it, and you don't have to think about it as much, right? So um, we just with coaching people, you can gradually build up. And some people will notice a calming and maybe sleep better pretty early on, but we do like to tell people to be patient. It's okay. not a magic pill or a quick fix. It takes time for the brain to learn the new patterns, just like it takes time to learn anything else, like riding a bike. So we give, give them a kind of a goal post of give it at least 15 sessions. Mm -hmm. um, but we are tracking their progress all along the way and my case management team is in there every 10 sessions looking at what their brain waves actually did throughout those sessions too. Oh, okay. So if I'm doing this at home or if I purchased this for, or is it, or subscribe to this for um, my out of school time program or my, my classroom, then there is support that you're providing on the back end. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the key to it. You don't want to just send this technology out and let anybody do what they want with it. It's very beneficial and it's non-invasive, but you've got to have that coaching and, and some case management behind the scenes to make sure the protocols are correct for that individual. Are you seeing, as you've been looking at this data, because uh, you, you've been doing this for a little while now, right? This isn't, this isn't brand new. 13. When did you start? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was about 13 years ago when my little guy was in that uh, yeah. <laughs> therapeutic program. Yeah, uh, and I started there and lived there for five months. Yeah. And are you seeing now that you've had, you've measured brain waves over a cons you know over a, a long time now, are you seeing any patterns develop? Because I know that um, you know on a different side of our concerns, we've we've seen some what seem to be some societal shifts in terms of levels of stress and anxiety. Is that showing up at all in your, in your data? Yeah, it absolutely is. I noticed that before the pandemic yeah. in the brain maps that we did. Now, early on, 13 years ago, when I first started with my son, we just did a single site evaluation in the center of the head. We didn't do the full cap, mm -hmm. but within a few years, I started doing those maps with the full cap. And yeah, we started noticing, uh, like I just mentioned a little bit ago, that even those folks that are coming in f for focus and attention issues or sleep issues or something, we would see these patterns of anxiety, yeah. basically. The, your beta wave, that fast, hypervigilant kind of processing wave being on the wrong side of the brain or elevated, causing people extra, you know. And so then the question is, why mm. is it in part, it's, it has to be the technology that's keeping us in that hypervigilant state, mm. right? I think that would probably be part of it. Um, our diets mm -hmm. are really not what they should be, um, you know, and the stress levels, just the societal stress level keeps elevating with all of the uh, everything that we're in tune with now. So oh, I, I believe we're kind of training our brains to be a little hypervigilant. Well, yes, I mean, it's, th there is, um, unfortunately, I, I think that there is an erosion of, of those protective factors. There's an erosion of resilience of all those things that we rely on in order to overcome adversity, kind of the, the community and relationships that we really you know, need. Um, you know, I want to go right. back. I had mentioned um, EMDR and kind of bilateral stimulation is what are what are some of the other benefits or do you know um any of the neurofeedback training versus the emdr or kind of the bilateral stimulation that we also see out in the space mm -hmm. i'm not um, trained in emdr mm -hmm. so i can't speak exactly to that but i know that when the brain is better regulated a lot of things can fall into place for people. Okay. We number the one we're looking for more restorative sleep and sleep cycles. Yeah. 
That's so important and we don't pay attention to that. Even young kids are not getting into that deep restorative sleep right. sometimes that they need. Um, so sleep is very important. And then some of that mood regulation has to kind of come into play. The anxiety, the depressive tendencies, the irritability, the you know impulsivity, things like that. And then next comes online your cognitive and your focus and your attention and your memory gets sharper. But we kind of want to see those different levels happening as people are better regulating their brain. And, you know, I'd mentioned um, ACEs and childhood trauma. Obviously, my, my audience uh, terribly familiar with the work of Bruce Perry and A.D. Burke Harris and, and the other people who have studied, Dr. Folletti, who have studied um, adverse childhood experiences. Do, uh, do you ever measure for ACEs in your work or is it n not as important? Well, I would love to include that in our platform. Right. It's currently not, but I think it is very important. And I did have a researcher, <coughs> a grad student, excuse me, that was working on her paper and did a, a correlation study using our database and our maps. And there was a direct correlation with the ACEs study scores, the, you know, elevated and oh, the frontal lobe asymmetries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And frontal lobe asymmetry is associated with depression and anxiety as well. Absolutely. So uh, she just applied for another grant to extend that study further. And I hope that happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because I think there's a correlation for sure. You mentioned that when you started this work, you had fewer sensors, you were measuring fewer brain waves. Um, what do you think the future holds for this kind of technology? Well, the future is, and part of my mission is that this should be in every household. Mm. Imagine how much our families would be better regulated as a whole if we could regulate each of our yeah. brains <laughs> in yeah. the family system and the ripple effect that would happen out into our society. So just like we have all these cell phones, it's just a normal thing now. I believe we should all be able to tune up our brain a little bit with some neurofeedback at home. So, I mean, our home program is a step in that direction, mm -hmm. but we've got some technology coming down the line that will make it even easier for people. And uh, we need to get it out there from, from the bottom up, from the families and the, the parents uh, up, because it's not coming from big pharma down, no. <laughs> you know. Well, and, and not to put you on the spot here, but, but I think that you raised this topic. Um, have you undergone it yourself? Oh, I have. Yes. Yes. Thankfully, um, probably not, you know, as soon as I needed it, though. <laughs> uh, it took me a while. <laughs> it took me a while to stabilize my kid. And then I was on the rampage and the mission to get it out there and teach doctors and other people how to use it. And um, for me personally, I've done a lot of sessions. Um, and one of the biggest things that it's helped me with is restoring that sleep cycle mm. that I didn't know was terrible all of my life. And um I got knocked off my feet with an autoimmune disease when I was 19, mm. very sick, c considered disabled actually, that bad, rheumatoid arthritis, all that kind of mm. stuff. Um, and so suffered for very many years in a high level of pain. And now I believe because I've restored that sleep cycle, my body can heal at night yeah. and it's starting to regulate my whole system. So my pain levels are minuscule compared to what I suffered with for decades. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. No, yeah. <laughs> it, it all seems more and more connected, doesn't it? I mean, that's where the research yeah. seems to be going. It, it's quite interesting. It really is. Yeah, it's, it affects your whole body, everything, you know. And I, I confess I don't know the literature um, on neurofeedback as well as I would like to. I, I've only been able to read a few studies of it, but it also seems that even a few training sessions um, because of neuroplasticity they seem to, the, uh, the results seem to last, that this isn't something, that this continues for a long time, as you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, the key study that I always um, think of is one that showed that there are changes in the gray and white matter of the yeah. brain after 20 neurofeedback sessions. Yeah. So 20 typical sessions, maybe 20 to 30 minute sessions. There are physical changes in the gray and white matter of the brain. And yeah, that doesn't change just like when you learn to ride a bike. You yeah. kind of retain that. You might be wobbly if you haven't gotten on it for 20 years, but you still remember it. So that's what happens with the learning process and the neurofeedback process. We are creating new pathways in the brain that will last 
Now, people do have setbacks. Mm -hmm. If they are in a car accident, they're exposed to toxins, they're in extreme stress, they may feel a setback. But you're right, those, those pathways that were created really don't just go away. I, I think we've read some of the same studies. I, I also read <laughs> that there are some people that don't respond. It's a, it's a small percentage, uh, according to the most recent literature. Um, do you have any insights about the people that don't get as much out of this? Yes, yes, and, and very small percentage yeah. with the technology that I've used. Okay. Um, and so maybe 5 to 7%, mm. I would say, don't respond. And normally that will be somebody that is, they have um, some type of metabolic issue that's okay. not being addressed, like thyroid, adrenal, something's off with that. Right. And we do have some screening to help refer out if we see indications of that. Okay. Um, the other person would be somebody that's under extreme stress. Okay. So we'll have kids that kind of, progress along and then they have a bit of a setback and they progress okay. along they have a setback and then we end up discovering they're being bullied in school mm. or there's some some other thing happening or if you're toxic you know marriage or something will definitely make it difficult for somebody to progress um, those are two of the most uh, common ones and then there are the people that really just um, they're improving but they're not seeing it they're kind of attached to who they are oh interesting you know yeah. So, you know, are you, do you encourage your, your, um, your subjects to continue with their traditional therapies while this is going on? Sure. Yeah. That only enhances the traditional therapy. When you start to better regulate the brain, sometimes that, um, they can process what they've been learning in the therapy that they, they just right. couldn't get before you know, or get past that stuck point. <laughs> you know, it's definitely, therapists love it for the stuck clients It seem to you know, can't get past a certain level. And like my kiddo, yeah. I think all of those years, he absorbed so much information from all of these different environments, different parenting techniques, different um, cultures that he was exposed to, but he couldn't do anything with right. that until we better regulated his brain. And now he's one of the most disciplined people I know. Wow. I want to thank you so much for being a mom on a mission and for bringing <laughs> this technology this tool uh, to more and more kids. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for having me. It was nice chatting with you. That was Diane Costo. For more information about Diane and Cemetery Neuropathway Training, please visit talkingaboutkids.com. From there, you also can find out about upcoming episodes, suggest a topic, Learn more about me and my books or submit your questions for future guests. Our theme song is by The Senators. For more of their music, go to thesenatorsmusic.com. And remember, kids are young goats and young children. And the difference is that young goats are easier to manage.